Good morning. Thank you for coming to the AMSAT Forum. Uh, really appreciate the time. I think you'll find this next two hours and 15 minutes to be very interesting and informative for you. I'm going to give you an overview of what's happening with AMSAT as an organization. Uh, the presenters after me will get more into the technical angles of what's happening with some of our projects, but I thought it would be important to give you a, a status report of the status of the organization itself. The AMSAT Board of Directors is, is elected on a biannual basis, and I just want to point out that the class of 2010 um, is up for re-election, if you will, with the, the elections coming up now. If you're interested in running for the board, nominations are due by June, June 15th to Martha. Basically, to be nominated, an individual has to have five signatures from a from an current AMSAT member or be nominated by a, a club that's affiliated with AMSAT, i.e. if you're at the club, a club membership. So if anybody's interested in perhaps working on the board, uh, your nominations are due by June 15th. Ballots go out in July and are counted in September. And so those folks that we currently have, Tom Clark, Lou McFadden, and Gould Smith, are, are up for re-election. I just want to point out, Tom Clark is over here in the corner, and, and Gould is here in the front row. Would you guys stand? I also want to point out the other board members that are here. Drew, could you stand up? Drew Glassbrenner, KO4MA. Um, Alan Biddle, who's our moderator, is here as well. So those are your board members that are currently here at Dayton with us. Thank you. From an organizational perspective, um, we've got a variety of positions that are open with various f uh, functions responsible. VP of Engineering, VP Operations, the President, the Executive Vice President, are, and the uh, Treasurer and are really the key senior officers of the organization. There are other people that, cover, that are appointed by the President, we call them little officers, um, that, that are associated with the running of the organization. From a responsibility perspective, um, the senior officers are elected by the board. So, uh, and it's on an annual basis. So I'm the current president, and when the board meets in October, they'll decide to either reelect me or find a new candidate. Um, but all the officers are, are annually elected by the board of directors. So uh, you know me, we just saw Drew. Our VP of Engineering, Tony Montero, is not with us today. Gould, you've already met. Alan, you've already met. The treasurer, Keith Baker. Keith, where are you? Why don't you stand up? Keith graciously agreed to uh, assume the position of treasurer earlier this year after our uh, former uh, treasurer, uh, Gunther Meisey, had to resign. Uh, many of you may remember Keith. He's had a long, um, distinguished uh, relationship with, yeah, extinguished, relationship with, with AMSAT. He was president back in the 1990s, uh, and he's come back and graciously agreed to serve as our treasurer, so thank you. A he's a retread. Uh, Martha Sergovitz, Mother Martha, if you will, is our one sole employee. She's based, of course, in her office in Silver Springs. She's at the AMSAT booth. So if you talk to Martha on the phone and haven't come by to say hello to her, please do so. Last fall at the BWI Symposium, we celebrated our 40th anniversary of AMSAT, a very, again, extinguished uh, history for the organization. Um, you can see some of the key players there in the picture. And of course, Alan talked about was it balding and graying? Yeah. Well, you know, this, unfortunately, this is a demonstration of it. Some of you may, of course, know some of these individuals, but Bill Tynan here, W3XO, uh, Perry Klein, who was our first president. Uh, let's see, we had Jan King in here too, don't we? Right next to Perry, right there. Um, so, yes, we've all aged, and, of course, the organization has aged to, to go along with it. Uh, we are basically in a situation right now where we're bringing new blood in, new leadership, uh, new satellite builders and the like. We'll get into the details a little bit about how that's impacted the organization. So what is AMSAT? Um, we've given an overview here of what we do. Uh, we are not the same AMSAT that uh, your fathers and grandfathers may have known. It's just like you know, GM at one time and said, we're not your father's Oldsmobile. Um, we are not your father's AMSAT. A lot of changes have taken place both internally and in the external environment in which we work and live. But the key thing is we've done a, a number of things over the last 40 years. And, of course, our legacy goes back to the first launch of Oscar I um, in 1961. Uh, that was really a milestone, uh, not only for first amateur radio satellite, but it was the first secondary payload to be released from a launch vehicle. And uh, I presume some of you may know what the primary payload was. Anybody remember? 
We didn't know it at the time. We thought it was a scientific experiment. It was actually a CIA Corona satellite that was being launched, a spy satellite for Vandenberg Air Force Base. So what's our mission statement? AMSAT designs, builds, and operates experimental satellites to promote space education. We deal with partnerships. And partnerships are becoming even more critical now than they have been over the last few years. Um, NASA, of course, with ARIS, but also with some other opportunities. Education, universities, and foundations. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, Leo, Leo Satellite Project and Educational Outreach. Education is the key to keeping us in space. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, we're also interested in scientific and technical innovation. Our vision statement uh, has been revised. For those that remember the previous vision statement, we really focused on high Earth orbit satellites as being our focus. That has, of course, changed. And we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, but we're now talking about deploying satellite systems. We still want wide area and continuous coverage, but now may take more satellites to do what a single HEO might have been able to do in a higher Earth orbit. Um, and of course, we will support a stream of LEOs to help support that. In terms of our accomplishments over the last year, at the AMSAT's annual meeting last October, uh, this was the, the checklist I presented. And I just want to go, and I'm going to use this as my, as my talking points as we continue and give you an update of where things stand today. The first thing I want to bring up is something called ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations. ITAR has had a major significant impact on AMSAT and our relationships with other AMSAT organizations around the world. Traditionally, going back to the 1970s, we worked very closely on technical issues involving other AMSET organizations. If you think about AO-10 and AO-13, those were German satellites, but they had a very heavy North American involvement. And of course, P-3D, which became AO-40, was also a German satellite. It was integrated in Orlando and, of course, launched from French Guiana. And of course, during that time, we were heavily involved on a technical basis with AMSAT UK, AMSAT Germany, uh, folks in, in uh, Finland, folks in Japan, folks in uh, uh, other European countries. And it was really a, a wonderful experience to have that degree of integration of, of cooperation on a technical uh, complexity of such as AO40. But the, the world has changed around us. In 1999, the US Congress instituted changes in, in the law because they were concerned about technological transfer to um, certain countries and they basically put a very strict and onerous process in place for Americans and American corporations that want to do business with foreign nationals. We were slow to recognize the impact of that and in fact P3D uh, became a question in our mind as to whether or not what we did under under the P3D project uh, was perhaps in violation of ITAR. And at that time we were also working on Phase 3E. The German satellite that was under development uh, looks very much like an AO-10 or AO-13 from a structural perspective, but they were anxious to use that spacecraft as a test bed for what they wanted to do, which was eventually come up with a P-5 project to go to Mars. So the volunteers that were involved in P-3E came to a screeching halt in terms of the work and contributions they were doing because there was a degree of uncertainty as to whether or not we were perhaps violating the law. And when you violate a law of this magnitude, you have serious potential consequences. So we decided back in October of 08 to come to grips with this whole ITAR issue. We retained an attorney based out in Denver, Colorado, Frank Shugat, who's an expert on dealing with ITAR issues for corporations and individuals. And we, we developed the strategy, which was what, which was first to come to grips with the fact that perhaps we need a document for the State Department, which manages the ITAR process, that perhaps we need to let them know what we did and find out if, in fact, whether or not we broke any U.S. laws. If we did, and we were, we're going to have to deal with ITAR, maybe come up with a way where we could put the stuff we were working under P3 and get it out of the ITAR environment, put it under another uh, regulation called commodity jurisdiction. Um, if necessary, look at what's called technical assistance agreements that would allow us to have a formal relationship with other organizations. Or perhaps there were other options we could do to try to recognize the fact that we were going to have to deal with ITAR. From a State Department perspective, AMSAT is a weird animal. You know, we are not a corporation. We don't have employees. Uh, we're not large. What are we? We're a bunch of guys that build stuff typically in garages, only we want to put it in space. And because of the fact we want to put it in space, suddenly we're dealing with regulations that were really not designed to, 
deal with an organization such as AMSAP. And I think that has created some uncertainty in their own mind as to how you deal with a bunch of volunteers on spacecraft, much less with a paid employee where if someone violates ITAR, the corporation can fire you. You know, there's a financial incentive there. Well, what do you do with a volunteer? Well, you tell them you can't get funding from us for the project you're working on, but there is no, there's not a heavy hammer like losing your job that we would be able to impose on a volunteer to manage to stay within the ITAR regulations. So what we did was we actually just, we submitted a voluntary disclosure. We basically documented everything we had done with P3E, explained the relationships, gave them documentation that had been published, um, showed them examples of the work that we had done. And they took three months to review our document and came back to us and say, verily, verily, you have sinned. You, in fact, did violate ITAR and don't ever do it again because if you do, we'll come after you. That was, an, that was an answer we sort of unexpected. What we didn't expect was the fact they didn't tell us exactly how we violated ITAR. You know, we worked on four different subsystems within P3E. We had different relationships, different ways of interacting with foreign nationals, but they didn't come back and tell us exactly what we did wrong. So even though we knew we did something wrong, we didn't know exactly what we did wrong. So we're still in the quandary of, well, what can we do, what can we not do in helping with the P3E project? So we decided, based upon some advice, that maybe we ought to do is take the subsystems that were involved with P3E and request the commodity jurisdiction request, which would put them under the Commerce Department. The Commerce Department regulations are a little bit less restrictive than ITAR. Uh, we still have to export and get an export uh, approval to actually ship stuff to a foreign country, but we could have technical conversations without any restrictions. Under ITAR, you cannot have technical conversations at all without proper... Uh, relationships established and approved by the State Department. So we submitted a request in July and they came back in November and said, uh-uh, you, you have to stay under ITAR. So we're now back square one. We still can't do anything. So we submitted an advisory opinion request in December asking them for clarification. One of the things that is not subject to ITAR is things that are in the public domain. So what does the State Department consider to be in the public domain? And can we put our stuff in the public domain and allow to have open conversations with foreign nationals about what's in the public domain? So we, uh, we submitted a request asking for clarification of the public domain and to be able to share technical data. They took their sweet time, came back in March, and basically said that what is considered to be public domain is stuff that is actually published, that is printed in a, in a magazine or in some sort of symposium proceedings, something that anybody could purchase um, and would be available through, through, a, through the written word, so to speak. Now think about that for a second. What is the primary means of communication that we have today? Does it involve publication? Not as we traditionally think of it. We think of it through the Internet. We think of it as websites and blogs and logs and email exchanges and all of that, uh, bulletin boards and, the, and, the, and so forth. None of that is considered to be, in the eyes of the State Department, to be public domain. So we cannot put stuff on a bulletin board or a, a, a website and declare it to be public domain. So anything we publish through the AMSAT journal, anything we publish through the AMSAT proceedings, anything that's published in the QST or CQ magazine or something like that would be considered public domain. So that's the strategy we're going to have to follow now is to make sure that as we do things, of course, we've always published, publicized ourselves as being open source. Uh, no, no secrets are hid except for you know, certain things you have to do to command a satellite. Um, we were going to make it totally open. So that's the status we're at right now. We are not in a position to basically have free exchange with our foreign national friends. We did come up with an idea of going through an export licensing approach called DSP-5 which basically for certain commodities, the State Department would, would basically give you a, a much more freer pass. But the issue in our mind today is every time we've asked for something, they've said no. So what are the prospects for going through a legal process of getting a DSP-5 export request? What are the chances of it being approved? And of course, there's real money being spent on these legal fees going through this entire ITAR process. So at this point, we're sort of hanging back. We're waiting to see what's going to happen in the legal front, the legislative front, as Congress now is starting to look at the ITAR situation again. Um, they're becoming more and more sensitive to the fact that the commercial interests are being negatively impacted by the way that ITAR is currently structured. It's had a negative impact on technological development in the United States. 
Customers are going overseas to get their satellites built because there's no ITAR involved in overseas uh, contractors. And so we are going to basically wait and see what ITAR does. But this has had a significant impact on how we build satellites. It is one of the reasons why moving forward you're going to see AMSAT North America basically developing satellites on our own and not necessarily working in a cooperative relationship we would like to do with other organizations. And by the way, foreign nationals can share information with us. There's no limitation on that. It's our ability to talk to the foreign national that's the issue. So let's move on. The Engineering Task Force. You know, back in 2008, we came to a screeching halt in terms of Eagle development for a variety of reasons. And we had to sit back and sort of do a reassessment of what are we going to do for, for our future space opportunities. So we put together a team led by Bill Ress. At this point, we did not have a VP of Engineering. This team basically acted as the VP of Engineering to evaluate what we would try to do in terms of moving forward on our engineering program. The team's purpose quickly evolved to this, asking themselves the question, what do we need to do to provide a realistic and affordable way to get AMSAT back into space? Eagle had some technical issues that were challenging in terms of how the engineering team was going to develop those issues, but the real issue with AM Eagle was money. When we came to the realization that all the options we were looking at, whether placing a high Earth orbit satellite and, uh, as a self-contained unit and release it as a secondary payload, or if we were going to do a rideshare opportunity, we, you may remember we had talked um, to Intelsat about the possibility of putting an amateur payload on one of their geosynchronous satellites. All of those uh, opportunities were extremely expensive in the order of over $8 million. And I don't know about you, but I don't have $8 million in my pocket, and we did not see a quick perspective in raising that kind of money within the amateur radio community. So clearly, Eagle came to a halt because we didn't see a viable conclusion based upon as, as we saw things back in, in 2008. So the team basically took a year to evaluate what's going on around us, the externalities that may affect what AMSAT is able to do and afford. Um, they evaluated various launch opportunities, different orbits, different size spacecraft, reinforcing the need for a modularization strategy. That is, let's build something that can be adapted quickly to any payload, any ride opportunity that may occur. Look at the various configurations of satellites that we may be able to do. And they came up with a set of recommendations, which I've listed here, that um, they thought we would want to take a look at. And one of the things we had to look at, too, was the ability to attract the next generation of satellite builders. The guys that built AO10, AO13, AO40, um, you know, like everybody else, they're, they're aging. And they're getting up to a point in their lives where they were not willing to build, you know, spend the, the, the midnight oil working on a satellite project. They had been there, they had done that. And it's something that younger blood would be involved with, would have the energy and the drive and the passion to complete. But we have to recruit and train the next generation of satellite builders. So in terms of a launch cost comparison, a 1U CubeSat, we'll talk about what a CubeSat is in a second, cost about $75,000 to launch. A 3U CubeSat, that's basically three CubeSats put together as one unit, about $230,000. A Microsat, such as AO51, um, $350,000 to $400,000. Aerosat, which we'll talk about extensively this morning, is essentially a free launch because the space agencies are going to take Aerosat to the space station for deployment. And of course, going to low Earth orbit is significantly cheaper than going to high Earth orbit. The other results of their analysis was is that a 12 kilogram microsat like AO51 is no longer the low cost way of getting into space. When we agreed to do AO51 after the launch of AO40, it was the cheap way to go to space. It was the cheapest alternative. And of course, we had extensive experience with microsats going back to 1990 with the launch of AO16, 17, 18, and 19. Um, and we, but we also recognized that our finances at the time were not going to be able to afford to build and launch an AO51 again, at least not with the funds we had on hand. We should continue to, vi to look on ride opportunities because on the ride share, you're just building the communications equipment and the host is responsible for the rest of the satellite. So clearly, that's a relatively low cost way to get communications equipment in space. And of course, we should now take a look at what had been evolving since the design of AO51, which is the evolution of the CubeSat. So the team came back and made a set of recommendations to the board. We should fund the building and launch of a 1U CubeSat. We should continue supporting the AirSat satellite program. 
we can continue to monitor launch opportunities because there may be something coming down the road that wasn't available at the time we did this study. And then we also want to look at some technological improvements that would help not only in the CubeSat arena, but also other space frames. So why are we building a 1U CubeSat? We announced this at the uh, annual meeting back in October. Um, it's affordable. We have the funding and have the ability to generate the funds to be able to afford the construction and launch of a 1U CubeSat. We need to build something. I mean, what's driven this organization through 40 years, what's kept the interest of the membership, is the fact that we are active satellite builders. And the last long duration satellite we built was, in AO, was AO51, released in 2004. Yes, we had SuitSat in 2006, but we need to get back in the business of building satellites. We wanted to take the technology that had been involved with AeroSat and apply it to other space frames. And so we had done some great work with AeroSat. Let's carry that forward. And of course, we wanted to use whatever we developed for a CubeSat um, to adapt it to other ROID applications as well. And then finally, universities have really been taking the lead on CubeSat development. Here was a way to, for us to work with universities and expand that educational outreach that we believe is the critical thing we need to generate outside support for what we do. So what is a CubeSat for those that may not know? Your picture of one here on the screen. It's basically a four inch by four inch cube, four by four by four. It was a, a, a standard design developed by Cal Poly and Stanford and everybody today is in, seems to be getting into the CubeSat arena. They are deployed by what's called a P-Pod, you can release up to three or one three U. Um, and again, people are excited about these because they're relatively low cost. They're relatively inexpensive to launch, they're inexpensive to build. And what's also evolving here is that the success of the CubeSats is now generating both commercial and military interest. Notice the National Reconnaissance Office has now signed an agreement with Boeing for Boeing to build 50 CubeSats. So think about, the, again, the evolution of the technology that has occurred. You know, we, we and, the, and, the, and the universities have shown that smaller and smaller is better and better. And as we've demonstrated the success and viability of that approach, um, now commercial and military interests are taking a, a part in it. That's going to create an impact on the availability of launch opportunities. So what's our 1U CubeSat going to be able to do? We have defined it as a UV FM transponder, um, which has not been done before in a, in a 1U CubeSat, both a beacon, a receiver, simple internal housekeeping unit, and deployable solar panels. So it's going to be a, it's going to move the technology a little bit forward, um, but it's a, a, a satellite that we think can be done relatively quickly and relatively inexpensively. The other thing we came across in this study is that there may be potentials for ride shares. And without getting into the specifics of what we're looking at, there is the potential, and right now it's, it's not real clear to us how real the potential might be, of actually putting a, a payload on someone else's satellite. It would be a low Earth orbit opportunity. Um, and we're going to try to keep our options open to take advantage of those kinds of situations as they develop. We also want to get involved with some, some technology development. And of course, you'll hear about the relationship we've got with IBM uh, Systems Engineering Center and with the State University of New York in Binghamton in terms of some of the work that's been done over the past year. So the board accepted the recommendations of the engineering team and we announced a fundraising campaign as well. We want to raise $100,000 this year. We want to raise $100,000 next year. That's to support the cost of the design, construction, and launch of a CubeSat and also give us the funding for a ride share if, should that materialize. Um, to date, we have generated about $50,000 of that $100,000 goal for 2010. Uh, the matching program that Steve uh, mentioned a few minutes ago with the DARA Matching Grant Program is designed to further encourage people to donate toward that fund this year. Um, that is funding that will be critical to be able to actually get our CubeSat constructed and, and launched. We finally came up with a well-qualified candidate to be our VP of Engineering. That's Tony Montero, AA2TX. Their focus right now on the engineering team is to complete AeroSat 1. AeroSat 1 is critical. We'll talk about the importance of it in a second. But AeroSat 1 is what we're focusing on right now. Once AeroSat 1 is completed, we have to deliver that satellite to Russia by the 1st of July. Then we will start focusing on our CubeSat, which we're going to call Project Fox. When we announced the Project Fox back in October, we didn't have a specific opportunity identified as for a launch. We knew that there were multiple launch opportunities for CubeSats, 
and that things are going to continue to evolve. We're now aware, for example, that NASA is actively pursuing secondary payload opportunities uh, with universities and not-for-profits. We're in conversation with them right now about potential opportunities. So Fox may be adapting, if you will, to the launch opportunity that we finally come up with. So um, at this point, we don't have a specific launch opportunity of, uh, advanced, but we are looking and evaluating what is out there and having conversations with NASA about the potential of getting into a launch opportunity that they're encouraging with the universities. One of the things I want to mention is this need to adapt the requirements of, playing, of applying educational missions. NASA is offering educational secondary payloads, but they have to have an educational component to them. So when we make a proposal to NASA, it's going to be not just we want to build this CubeSat, but what are the educational benefits associated with our launch of our CubeSat and how that would help students on the ground. So we are working very hard to come up with uh, an approach that incorporates both the needs of amateur radio as well as the educational component to be able to, um, to work with that. We've worked with several people from the league, for example, and coming up with, a, with, a, with an idea of how we can do that. So I'm confident that we can put together um, a package that would meet the educational stipulations that NASA would require, and at the same time come up with a satellite that you would all enjoy. Meanwhile, the CubeSec technology continues to evolve, and I just want to mention a couple of things here. I mentioned Boeing already. They've got a platform they've, they've, they've released and it's, that some of the universities are using. SpaceQuest, which built AO51, um, has also got some CubeSat designs now that they're, that they're working at. So we have not yet started our formal process on Fox, but clearly we'll be looking at um, what's out there today, whether a commercial off-the-shelf opportunity should be taken advantage of, and perhaps focus our engineering talent on what be, might be an experiment or some sort of additional capability built into what would be a commercial off-the-shelf satellite. By the way, next week the small satellite conference is taking place in Chantilly, Virginia. We will be represented there. Tom Clark, K3IO, will be there. Uh, Bob Davis, uh, KF4KSS, who is our mechanical engineering guru, guru uh, will be there as well. The other thing I wanted to mention was the fact we're trying to find a home for the AMSAT lab. Uh, last October I reported we were in litigation with the University of Maryland Eastern Shore regarding the lab that had been positioned in Maryland. Um, that litigation has been resolved and we've basically broken our ties with that situation and we're now looking for a new home. And we left the AMSAT lab uh, in return for, for a financial payment. And so we don't necessarily have the physical lab we had in Orlando or in Pocomo to move to a new location. We'd be establishing an entirely new lab. We started a conversation in 2009 um, with the University of Florida. It turned out there was a UF individual at the presentation that uh, Drew Glassburn gave at the Villages Amateur Radio Club. The guy picked up on it and talked to Norman, Dr. Norman Fitzcoy at UF, who says expressed serious interest and working with AMSAT on developing a home for AMSAT at the University of Florida in Gainesville. We've been working for the past six months basically on a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, that covers both the needs of the university as well as AMSAT. Um, that process is close to finalization. I'm hoping we'll have this resolved in, in, a, in a very short period of time. Dr. Fitzcoy, by the way, is on sabbatical. He's out in New Mexico this semester at the Air Force Research Lab. Um, that really hasn't affected our timing of our MOU process, but it does suggest that you know we, we can take our time in getting this thing developed and finalized. Why relocate from the eastern shore to the swamp? Now, I, this, is, this is the Midwest. Do people know what the swamp is? We do have some gators here. Larry, the swamp? Go Gators the Swamp, the Florida field is nicknamed the Swamp. So why are we going to move to the University of Florida in Gainesville is essentially the question. One is the location of a major university campus will be right in the center of campus in the engineering building, integrated with their activities right then and there, potential for student projects, again the opportunity to, to provide students with an opportunity to develop flight hardware um, offers a real benefit. If you think about major donors and whether or not they want to support AMSAT and what we do, they're not necessarily interested whether we can talk to Japan. They are interested in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and if we can help get students into the engineering field and give them real-world experience, 
people are willing to underwrite that. And if it helps us in the process, so much the better. But we can't just go out and ask major donors for money so we can launch an amateur radio satellite. But if we tell them we're building a satellite that students are involved with, that is the hook, if you will, to generate significant outside support. And by the way, AMSAT, of course, has never really had much experience in outside fundraising. We've certainly been very uh, uh, involved with working within the amateur radio community, but we have to learn how to go out and do ma major capital campaign drives. How much time? Five minutes. Over. All right, I'm going to cut it off right here. I'm, I'm going to let uh, let Gould and all talk about Arisat, and, and in Binghamton we'll, we'll have Dr. Roger Westgate talk about that. Um, if people have questions, please uh, don't hesitate um, to see me afterwards. Thank you.